Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, talked about this. Uh, we're going to be doing some series of studies on who is Jesus to you. And um, we're going to start with King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Okay. So if you want to turn to Revelation 19.11, that's where we're going to start. So each subject that we get into is going to be a little bit detailed. Sometimes it might not be, but this one is going to be broken down in a lot because there's a lot to King of Kings and Lord of Lords as far as is Jesus really this to us? Okay. And does it reflect by the life that you're living? So let's start in Revelation 19.11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God." And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of wrath of the Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's where we get that statement from. So if you go back, we read that this pretty much sums up what a king does and what a lord does. Okay, In righteousness he doth judge. That's where we're going to start this study, uh, first series of this study on kings and lords. King of kings and lord of lords. Okay, he, In righteousness he doth judge. It says he makes war. Okay, they have armies. Kings and lords have armies. Okay, it says here he shall rule them with the rod of iron. Okay, he rules. And it talks about a sharp, uh, a sharp sword. Okay, when we get into that study uh, where the word of the king is, there is power. Okay, that sword, a king has power. His word has authority. Okay. And Jesus' authority supersedes all authorities. Let's get a little ahead of myself. What we're going to start with is, In righteousness he doth judge. The first part of the kings of, King of kings and Lord of lords, we're going to talk about judgment. Okay, Is Jesus your king? Capital K, King of kings, and capital L, Lord of lords. Is he that to you personally? Okay. First, we're going to start off with... Uh, saying that I am a King James Bible believer. Make sure you have your King James Bibles with you and open them up and follow along. Some of my studies get to be so detailed it takes me a long time. When I start flipping through them, the video ends up being like two hours almost and I'm trying to keep the videos down. So we're going to be reading the verses and hopefully you are opening your book and following along. When I watch other Brothers in Christ's studies, I have my Bible open and I'm pausing the video and I'm following along. So please have your King James Bibles out. That's God's perfect written word in English. Okay. So first thing we're going to start with is turn to Deuteronomy 16, 18. Okay. Man will always fail to judge righteous judgment without Jesus Christ. Okay. Without God's righteousness shown to us. Okay. We're not going to get to that part when we start talking about the sword, his word, the word of the king, there is power. God gives us guidelines. It's his righteousness that we're to follow. Okay. So Deuteronomy 16, 18. Judges and officers shall thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, throughout my tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. Not their judgment, just judgment. God's judgment. Okay? He lays down the rules and the, reg <laughs> the law in the Old Testament, the do's and don'ts, instruction and righteousness for us in the New Testament, okay? and says, okay, this is, this is the guideline. Not guideline. I hate using the word guide. Sometimes you got to get words out of your vocabulary. Here is the standard that God accepts. It's a command. Here's the instruction of righteousness. Okay. So now we're going to see, are God ordained versus man ordained? What happens when men separate themselves from God and judge on their own? And you see that a lot today with these false Christians, okay? professing Christians. They will judge 
their judgment, okay? And they ignore God's judgment. But they'll stand there and say that, oh, but Jesus is my king and he's my Lord. Is he? Then why are you going off of your judgment and ignoring God's judgment? Let's look at an example here. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1. Okay. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judge over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. Now it says his ways, talking about Samuel, but Samuel walked after God's ways. Okay. Verse 4, Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. As you see right there, there's an example. These men are supposed to be judging according to the Lord. The Lord says this is what the do's and don'ts. Okay? All the laws, the Levitical laws, all of them are written down. They're supposed to uphold God's law and do righteous judgment according to God's judgment that he lined out. You know, in the Old Testament, it talks about uh, if you commit adultery, the man and the woman that committed adultery will be taken out and stoned. That's the judgment. They're supposed to be hold, there's the law that was broken, and that's the judgment for breaking that law. Okay. So, here, verse 6. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Okay. Man, when man gets involved and man starts straying from God, Old Testament Levitical laws, the new... For us today, God's perfect written word, people attacking God's word, right? When you come across somebody who attacks God's perfect written word, uh, they don't believe that Jesus isn't their king and Jesus isn't their Lord. Because th that Lord commands and you obey. That king commands and you obey. Right? Judgment. Okay, that king, that Lord will judge you. But here, you see how men can stray when they stray from this, God's perfect written word, and start doing their own judgment, going off their own righteousness, which they don't have. There's none righteous, no, not one. Okay. They fail. Uh, people look at it. Start with Saul. I'm just paraphrasing. You can look up the story of Saul. But Saul, um, he thought he did he disobeyed God and thought his authority was better than God's. Well, I'm going to do it my way, and I'm going to give in to the people and do what the people want. Oftentimes, you'll see that people with power and authority will give the illusion, or they'll sometimes give the people what they want so they can keep the power. Okay. It's there. But Saul disobeyed God. He thought he knew better. Okay. King David, okay, he committed adultery and had a man murdered. What does the law say about adultery? What does the law say about murder? He started getting to the point where he thought he could get away with it, that he was above God's law. Okay. That he was uh, exempt. You know. uh, King Solomon, all right, I'm just going off the first three kings. When they start straying from Jesus Christ's righteousness... The law, the Levitical law, God's commands, God's way of doing things, they failed. And towards the end of Solomon's life, uh, estranged women, he married a lot of women that were of the heathen nation, different kindreds outside the Jewish people, and they pushed him over to false gods. And he started worshiping, I think it was Baal, and part of that worship, when you study it, is to cause children to go through the fire. They were sacrificing babies, children to appease a false god. Okay. What happened? He strayed from God's righteousness and decided that he could do whatever he wanted. Okay. Anytime man decides to stray, 
For today, for us brothers and sisters in Christ, anytime you start trying to stray from God's words and start going off your own judgment, well, God says that this is what's supposed to happen. We're going to start talking about the judgment for us. But this is supposed to happen, okay? You're to do this. Don't do that, okay? This is truth. You're to stand for absolute truth. Uh, Isaiah 33, 22. You say, well, that's a king. He says, give us a king to judge us. Okay. Isaiah 33, 22. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. How can you judge if you don't have laws to judge by? He's not just gives us, not only does he judge, but he's the lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Okay. A Lord can be king. And what we're talking about Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, he is king. He is a king. So a Lord can be a king. Turn to John chapter 7, verse 24. It says, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Our judgment is supposed to be based off here. Are we to judge Yes, that's a whole nother study that brothers in Christ have done. I've done touched on it here and there throughout different studies. We are commanded to judge according to this Bible. That's a commandment right there. Okay. We're to judge righteous judgment. Our righteousness, when we try to judge of ourselves, what happens? You start falling back into the appearance. You fall back into pleasing men over pleasing God, being respecter of persons, okay? Doing things that benefit you, that feed the flesh. Okay, I want to be able to do this, so I'm going to say it's wrong for you to judge me on this. You're wrong in doing this, but I'm okay with it. I mean, I can just keep going on and on. But right there you see righteous judgment. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They've all gone out of the way. They've together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. So when we judge, when it's saying judge righteous judgment, what's it talking about? God's judgment. Now I know this is Old Testament, but they had the Levitical laws. Okay. Righteous judgment. Now, we're going to talk about up there where it says, we already see that this is pushing us over into in righteousness he doth judge. Okay. Now Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords. A king judges and a lord judges. Okay. A king and a lord uh, was it is a lawgiver. Okay. They set the standard, they set the laws of the land and say, okay, now I'm going to hold you accountable to him and I'm going to judge you. Did you obey the laws that I gave down? Did you obey the commands that I gave down? And the number one command is obeying the gospel for us today. Okay? And you'll find the gospel in the King James Bible for English-speaking people. Only the King James Bible has the true gospel. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confessing both in prayer and asking God to save you. Okay, the true gospel, the changed life gospel, to become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Okay, you become a, a new creature in Christ Jesus. You are, we're going to get to there, you're created in Christ Jesus. There's going to be a change in your life. And God's going to start judging you. Now, we're going to talk about in righteousness, he doth judge. So it's not just judgment that's being judged by any judge, it's righteous judgment. So we're going to go th start out with Psalms. Okay. Psalms 35, 24. And here's the kicker. Let's read it. Judge me, O Lord my God. Judge me, O Lord my God, according to thy righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. King... I think King David, some, uh, some of the Psalms were written by, uh, I think, Solomon, but most of them were written by King David. He's saying, judge me, O Lord, my God. We're going to talk about the fear of the judge, but judge me, 
O Lord my God, according to thy righteousness, not mine, according to thy righteousness. Is that the attitude you have, brothers and sisters in Christ? Okay? Lord, judge me according to this book. Now, that's a scary thing. We're going to get into the fear. That's a scary thing. Okay? Uh, jump ahead a little bit to the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, to me, I, I, I'm, I fear the judgment seat of Christ. I do. And that affects how I live today. And it's supposed to affect us, brothers and sisters in Christ, how we live today. Psalms 96, verse 10. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth, the world also shall be established, that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Yes. Jesus is the righteous judge. His judgment is true, and when he lays it down, there is no, he might be wrong, or he's not right, or he's not the final authority. Yes, he is. He's, he's the only one that can judge righteously. You see in the Bible, we read a couple of parts where it seems like it's pointing at the person, telling the person you can judge righteously. It's not saying you are capable of it. It's talking about you're to judge righteous judgment. And that righteous is God, Jesus Christ. Okay. Psalms 96, verse 13. If I, Because there's a lot of them. <laughs> Jump down to 13. Before the Lord he for he cometh for he cometh to judge the earth he shall judge the world with righteousness and the earth with his truth there it goes back to the word remember he's a lawgiver okay the word of god psalms 98 9 before the lord for he cometh to judge the earth with righteousness shall he judge the world and the people with equity. Okay. There we see it again with righteousness. Now, how do we know that Jesus is the judge, the ultimate judge? His authority supersedes all authority. Well, we just read when we started the study that it says he's got... Um, he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. That means his authority supersedes all authority. So Jesus is the judge. Turn to John 5, verse 22. John 5, 22. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Not some judgment, not just, you know, just for the lost world. The lost world is the only ones that are going to get judged. No. All judgment unto the Son. And as we're going to keep reading, that judgment includes everyone, saved and lost. That all men should honor the Son, all men, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Do you treat Jesus Christ like he is your judge? Well, you know, kind of. Then you don't honor the Father. You're not honoring Jesus Christ as a judge, as a king, as a lord. Not just any lord, not just any king, but a capital K king and a capital L lord, king of kings and lord of lords. You turn to John chapter 5, verse 30. Jump down to 30. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. So Jesus is the ultimate judge. It has been given to him by the Father. He will judge all judgment through all men, because that all men may honor the Son. All men. That's everybody. Okay. Let's get into, I'm going to go through these real quick. Fear and fear the judge. Are we to fear the judge? Okay. What does the Bible say about fearing God? 
People always say, well, are we supposed to be in fear and run around cowering and everything? Uh, no, the Bible says that we are not given a spirit of fear. Right? I don't have this one down. Let's look this up real quick because I want to get the whole thing. There is uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Okay? We're not supposed to be running around in fear today. Okay? What we call the church age, from the death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ. Okay? But the Bible commands us to fear God. And what's that fear? I believe that fear is based off of Jesus and God being a judge being a king and being a lord, and they judge. Mm -hmm. Psalms 111.10 fear, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. There we see again, uh, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and a good understanding have all they that do His commandments. If you fear God, you're going to do your best to obey His Word. It goes hand in hand. Why? Because God's going to judge you one day. He's going to judge me one day. Yeah. Proverbs 1.7 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. You mean there's people who despise the Word of God? There's even people who proclaim to be a Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women who despise instruction. They despise wisdom and they despise instruction. They have the right words sometimes, but look at their deeds, their actions. Do they line up with their words? No, oftentimes because they despise wisdom and instruction and they don't fear the Lord. Proverbs 9.10 the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. There we see the fear of the Lord again. Proverbs 15, 33. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. The instruction of wisdom. Lord, I fear you. Tell me what to do. I, I don't want the judgment... To come down on me saying, you failed. You did wrong. Lord, tell me what to do. Command me. Give me instruction. You're the lawgiver. Okay. And I understand that once you've given us this, when I got saved, God gave me a King James Bible, and he started opening my eyes and changing my life. Okay, I started having fear when the understanding came to me, because I didn't understand this as a false Christian in my lost life, that someday I'm going to be standing for God, and He's going to judge me according to this book, according to His Word, His instruction. Okay, So, let's go, move on to a king judges, a lord judges. Okay, They're lawgivers. A, a lord can be king. A Lord can be a king and a Lord. That's why we got Lord, Lord, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So, the world will be judged. I kept saying it, but we need scripture. If I say everybody will be judged, we need scripture. So, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin, not end, not only here, but begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Now, I always push this verse for instruction and righteousness to let people know that for this judgment that's coming, uh, you need to judge yourself first. The judgment seat of Christ. Okay. Make sure you're not having hypocritical judgment, but you need to judge your life as a Christian. Judgment must first begin here. Then you're able to judge brothers and sisters in Christ according to the Word of God. You judge yourself. And I'm going to keep grabbing this. You judge yourself first according to His righteousness. Then you judge your brothers and sisters in Christ according to His righteousness. 
And lastly, you judge the world by letting them know that they are sinners. They're on their way to hell, and they need a savior. Okay? They have a sickness, and they need a cure. That's what I always press for instruction in righteousness. But for this study, for context, for doctrine, uh, there's two judgments. Okay? There's the judgment seat of Christ, and there's the great white throne judgment. Judgment, if you look at this chronological order, timeline-wise, uh, the uh, judgment seat of Christ happens first. Then the great white throne. Mm -hmm. And notice it's a serious thing. That's why it says, And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel? It's a serious thing. It's a fearful thing. Okay. Judgment's still going to happen for everybody, saved and lost. Uh, and what's going to be judged by? Once again, the Word of God. Turn to Hebrews 4.12. What are we going to be judged by? Mm -hmm. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Okay. We're going to be judged by his book, and the whole world is going to be judged, saved and lost. So let's start with us, the saved, because that's what it says. If ju the judgment must first begin at the house of God. It's going to start with us. So we are judged first. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the thing done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Some people think it's just our good works. Our, what we believe is good works is going to be thrown on there, and, and the works that are reprobate that we think are good works, they're just worthless. That's what's going to get burnt up. No, it says here, according to he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Our bad works are also going to be judged. Mm -hmm. So, Christians are judged? Absolutely. He'll judge everything you have done in your life as a Christian, the good, the bad. Remember, it's righteous judgment. From the moment you get saved, everything from your lost life, I believe according to Scripture, it's completely washed away. You won't be held accountable to that. What you're going to be held accountable for is your life. When you start, you, tr you get saved, um, you become a new creature in Christ Jesus to the moment that you die or Jesus Christ comes back and gets us. That's what you're going to be judged on. The good and the bad. How many of us have screwed up a lot in our life as a Christian? In our walk as a Christian? All right. I'm the chiefest of sinners. All right. I'm the one that I feel like I've just totally screwed my life up so much as a Christian, and I've made so many mistakes in my life. Right. Uh, I'm not saying my life is completely bad. I've done some good work for the Lord. This isn't pride. I'm trying to be in the ministry. I'm trying to do right by the Lord. I'm trying to live right. But I'll be honest with you, I've fallen flat on my face a lot, especially as a babe in Christ. Do I fall on my face as often? Not as much, but I still do. And I look at my life as a Christian, and when I stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat, there's fear there. Okay? All my bad works are also going to be reflected with the good. Everything's going to be shown. Everything's going to be made known. Okay? That's a fearful thing. If Jesus is truly your Lord and your King, you, have, you understand that He is your judge, righteous judgment, and you have fear that, hey, that fear is trying to motivate me today. To do what's right. Okay. Uh, Psalms 139.1 O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Remember what we read in Hebrews 4.12. His word, uh, it, um, the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Thou comp Compass my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. What would we read over there? Being judged, whether it be good or bad. You mean God knows all your ways? Everything you've ever done? Everything you've ever thought? Yeah. 
For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. There's no getting away with it. There's nothing that we can do in secret that God doesn't know, that God hasn't seen. All right. Turn to 2 Corinthians 10.5. We're going to get on the thoughts. Right? People think it's just actions. It's just my actions. That's all God's going to judge me on. It's just my actions. Well, we read up there, according to he hath done, that's true. But the Bible warns us our thoughts can lead to bad actions. That's why we're supposed to keep our thoughts clean. 2 Corinthians 10.5. Casting down imaginations. How many people struggle with that? They'll be sitting there, I'll be talking with the Lord, I'm just sitting there thinking about some work that has to get done, and my mind starts to stray, and I start thinking about things I shouldn't be thinking about. Right. Okay, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringeth into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You stay in this book, you're reading this book daily, you're doing things that you can give God glory in, you're doing things you can give God thanks in, you're doing things that you can do in the name of Jesus Christ. All right. It's going to help you to br uh, bring every thought into captivity and to the obedience of Christ. When you start straying from the Word of God and you start falling into sin and you start falling into temptation, when you get away from God's Word, that's where your thoughts you start getting these thoughts. Why not do this? Why not do that? Oh, it's not that big of a deal. Oh, God will forgive you. Oh, Jesus isn't coming anytime really soon. He might not. I don't think he's going to be here within the next week or two. It might be a few more years. And you don't live every day like Jesus is coming back. And when he gets you, we're going to be going to the judgment seat of Christ. You don't have that fear and that uh, we're going to get to it about the appearing, looking for the appearing of Jesus Christ every day. There's two things you have to understand, brothers and sisters in Christ. This might be my heart, but I believe that there's other brothers and sisters in Christ out there that feel the same way. I want to go home. <laughs> I mean, I want Jesus to come get me, and part of me is like hesitant. Okay? I want Jesus to come get me because I am sick and tired of this body of flesh. I am sick and tired of this lost world that rejects Jesus Christ and wants nothing to do with Jesus Christ. I want to see Jesus in the clouds to call me home. Okay? But the hesitation is, is I'm struggling because I'm trying so hard to get some good works done because I know I've cut so many bad. And I'm hesitant because I'm like, am I, I, I'm not ready. I don't know, I never will be. But that attitude of striving to say, hey, I don't know, just standing before, am I ready? I'm not ready. How do I say it? I fear the judgment that's coming at the judgment seat of Christ. I fear all my bad works being thrown up there and standing before the Lord. Well, I won't be standing. My face will be in the ground and I will have tears but, and I will be so appalled of myself at how I've dishonored God and my bad works and be blessed by any reward God will give me for the good works I do have. And according to Scripture, but we're to bring our thought and uh, every thought in obedience of Christ, and having a and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience, when your obedience is fulfilled. Okay. We're supposed to do our best not to be disobedient. We're supposed to be obedient, but you're supposed to bring even your thoughts under subjection. Because what happens? The temptation. That's where it starts. It starts here. And then it starts manifesting itself physically. And when it gets to that point, you start doing bad works. You start doing things you're not supposed to. Sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall, tr fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire." 
That's the difference right there, brothers and sisters of Christ. That is the difference between the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne. Okay. We're going to be judged on our works, but our bad works aren't going to condemn us to hell when you're saved. Why? I see. Our works will be judged one day, yet Jesus' righteousness and the blood he shed cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's why it says, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. Right? That's the key. Because people say, well, why are we being judged upon our works? We're being judged upon our works to get rewards. Okay? And like I said, but he himself shall be saved. We're not going to go to hell because of our bad works, because of sin. Because God has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. We confess our sins. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I am still a saved sinner. I'm still a sinner. I'm just saved. There's two types of sinners out there in the world. You have saved and you have lost. Okay? There is nobody that can say that, stand and say, I have never sinned except Jesus Christ. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. So we see there, the vast verse that we read, there's going to be rewards. We're going to be judged on our works. So we're going to be judged whatever we do in our body, whether it be good or bad, and we're going to be judged off our works that we've done for the Lord. Okay. For 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. And I just don't want to scream right now, but there's an exclamation point there. He's raising his voice. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Okay. You're supposed to do it willingly. I'll say it again. I've come across people who say, I don't feel I'm called into the ministry of uh, reconciliation. I don't feel called to preach the gospels. Some people might, but I believe that's a calling and that's a different part of the ministry. No. It's a calling for everybody who gets saved. We are all in the ministry of reconciliation, and we're supposed to do it willingly. Okay, but there it talks about a reward. Uh, Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Okay. Paul talks about this. Uh, uh, we're not supposed to sin that grace may abound. That's there. But talks about how some people can abuse the gospel when it comes to saying, okay, I'm over you. And start pushing, you start falling into the trap of teaching works and faith uh, and that you can lose your salvation and you hold that power over them. All right? Paul never did that. Okay? He taught the true gospel. 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law. And people like to skip this next part because they say, well, see, we can look like the world, act like the world, we can compromise, we can do sin, we can do whatever it takes to win the world. They don't like to keep reading, so let's keep reading. Being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. Right? Paul is still under this. He's not saying that you can compromise and become like the world to win the world. It's not what he's saying here. Okay? He went to the Gentile people. Okay? He wasn't telling them, hey, you have to get circumcised. You have to keep the Sabbath. He wasn't telling them any of this stuff. Okay? That I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save 
All of them. All right? I got to become like the world to win the world. That way we can save tons of people. What does Paul say here? I might by all means save some. He understands only a few people are going to get saved. The world as a whole is not going to be saved. Like I said, t today, and these, these are old numbers, so today it's probably more, over 50% of the world's population believes in a Jesus Christ. Not the Jesus Christ of Scripture, but they believe in a Jesus Christ. Paul's saying only some, that he might save some. It would be a blessing, almost like a miracle, if he saves some. That's why uh, the angels sing over one soul that's lost, gets saved. Verse 23, And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run a race, run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. But we an incorruptible. There it goes. I see the contrast. You go back up to the contrast up there was talking about people who preach the gospel willingly and they preach the true gospel. It's not about them. It's not about being people pleasers. It's not about compromise, becoming like the world. It's about preaching the gospel willingly. Lord, command me, I will go. Right? And then you have the people who do it to make money. They try to make money off the gospel. They do it because they're forced to. I'm part of this club. I'm part of this occult. Right? I'm part of my Babel building, and they tell me I have to, so I, I guess I have to. Right? Okay, they're trying to, we're trying to, uh, uh, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. They're going to get a corruptible crown. We do it, but we an incorruptible Verse 26, I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Here we see one of the rewards you get is preaching the gospel. Getting out there preaching the gospel, handing out gospel tracts. I had a brother in Christ uh, that he'd hand out tons of gospel tracts, and he... He's got a lot more courage than I do, and he hand, he he puts them out like he doesn't just hand them out to people, but he likes putting them everywhere he can in all the stores and everything. And right now with this whole um, coronavirus thing going on, and everybody being on lockdown and telling people the stores are closing, there's very few stores in some areas. You have to be escorted and make sure you stay six feet away from everybody and apart. And it's all this junk, Ola. And he's getting a little down because he doesn't get to go out and give out uh, play, place gospel tracts a lot. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that can really kill your testimony, we've talked about this in previous studies, is if you're living in sin and you're doing something that the world looks at and says, hey, you're a hypocrite. The Bible says you're not supposed to do it, supposedly, and you're doing it and everything. And you can lose your testimony with people. Okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, someone who's an alcoholic, if you start drinking and getting drunk and then you turn around and tell them, hey, you know what the Bible says, you're, if he's sober, you're not supposed to be drunk. Drunk is a sin, and, and, that, and you're trying to use that to show that they're a sinner and in need of a Savior. They're not going to listen to you, and rightly so. Why? I mean, they need to listen to truth, but they're not going to listen to you. Why? Because you've lost your ten, uh, testimony, because you didn't bring... You didn't keep, uh, what was it? But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to, you other, preached to others, I myself shall be a castaway. You can lose your testimony. So remember, all this stuff we're talking about here is about the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to be judged. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. We're going to hit not a lot of them, uh, but we're going to talk about some of the crowns. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. 
okay? You have a crown of righteousness, there's a reward for keeping an eye out every day. And it's not just looking up. I like looking at the clouds and saying, Lord, is today the day? But I've always preached this and I've always taught that. What it's talking about is, are you living every day understanding that one day you're going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. Jesus can come back any day. Okay? Are you living right? Are you doing your best to live a life of Christ? To earn rewards in heaven and to please God? Okay? Good works. So there's a crown we get. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We're looking for Jesus Christ. We're trying to live every day for Him. And I always tell people this, when I was newly saved, I had the attitude that, I don't want to lose my place. I had an attitude that I'd be blessed just to get through the door. And I'm getting through the door now. I'd be, because God saved me, true gospel, uh, that I'd be blessed to wash the saints of the feet, everyone who comes and goes. I, that would be a blessing. I didn't understand that we're supposed to desire and aspire, uh, if I'm using the right word, we're supposed to have a drive to, to earn rewards. To have more than that okay i didn't understand that when i was first saved but as god started working on me started opening the scriptures through my studies and through brothers and sisters and well, brother, brothers in christ studies and sometimes sisters in christ have shown me some things we're supposed to desire more than that we're supposed to i said if i got a copper coin i'd be blessed because we start reading when i was a babe in christ about coins um we're supposed to desire more Rewards. We're supposed to work. We're supposed to have that attitude of, uh, Lord, command me. What do I do? What do I need to do? Okay, we're um, Minister of Reconciliation. Okay, I want to do my best to preach the gospel when you open the doors for me. When I fail you, Lord, please have mercy on me. Give me strength, Lord. I'm going to lay gospel tracts everywhere. That's usually the first step I tell people to do. Is um, If you don't have courage to actually talk to people yet, because God will give it to you, um, just start taking gospel tracts and laying them places. Okay, that'll help. Okay, the Bible gives me the do's and don'ts in my life, instruction and righteousness. I need to start obeying those. Right? I need to look for His appearing. I need to live every day like Jesus could come back today. And oftentimes when you fall into sin and temptation, your body, your flesh tries to tell you, well, He won't come back today, He'll come back later. It's no big deal. It's that motivation, that fear of that judgment that motivates you to say, okay, I'm sorry, Lord, I've dropped my cross. I need to deny myself, repent. I need to pick up my cross, forsake that sin that I'm doing, and I need to get back to serving the Lord, get back to doing works, good works. Okay? Here's a big one that a lot of people just really get this in there. Good works will follow true conversion. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. People like 8... And they love 9, but they don't like reading 10. So we're going to read all three. I'm not going to leave them out, leave one out. Okay. Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace are you saved through faith. That faith is in repentance, because it takes faith to repent to a God you can't see. It takes faith to believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. If you didn't see it, you weren't there. But you believe it. It takes faith to confess both in prayer. It takes faith to ask a God to save you because you have to believe that He can save you. Okay, it takes faith. That's the through faith there. And you'll have a lot of people attack that. Why? Because they don't fear God. They don't fear His judgment. He's not their king and He's not their Lord. They can scratch it and make out their own gospel if they want. That's going off on a tangent though. You know, Paul warns about people preaching another gospel, another Jesus, and getting people to receive another spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's an Antichrist spirit. But let's keep going. And that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And people like to stop there. See? Not of works. We don't have to do any good works to be saved. We can be saved and just continue living a life like we did before we got saved. 
Uh, what's verse 10 saying? For we, who's the we? Saved sinners are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. When you get saved, works, good works will follow. Your attitude towards sin set changes. Your attitude towards God set changes. God, you are my king. You are my Lord. You are my judge. You're going to judge me. Command me, O Lord. Tell me what to do. So I can be a little, I want to say a little prepared, but we should be 100% prepared. But we still have this body of flesh and we still give in to sin and temptation. But God's trying to give us something to help us with the judgment seat. So we go there, we're not just standing there, and everything we've done is bad. Everything gets burned up. Uh, no, he's given us the way to have good works. So not all, everything gets burnt up at the judgment seat of Christ. But we are created uh, in Christ Jesus unto good work, works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Once again, who's the we? Save sinners. So when you have someone saying, oh, there doesn't have to be a change in your life. You don't have to have an attitude change towards sin. You don't have to have a fear of Jesus judging you one day. Uh, you don't have to have a fear of any of that. Just, you can live however you want. You, there's carnal Christians out there. Uh, they're not created in Christ Jesus. Because the Bible says we're created in Christ Jesus on two good works. When verse 8 and 9 apply, verse 10 applies. And like I said, they like to leave it out. So as we're reading through there, is Jesus your king and your Lord? You say, yes, he is. So you're telling me that you understand the judgment that's coming. And you're doing your best every day to live a life of Christ, created in Christ Jesus into good works. Are you, every day you're looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, whenever the opportunity presents itself, are you preaching the gospel or leaving gospel tracts out places? If you're saying no to all this, or most of this, if you're saying no to all of this, I would tell you to check your salvation. Check whether you be in the faith, as Paul says to the Corinthians. Okay, Where's the fear of the Lord? Where is the, you treating the Lord personally with your actions, not just your words, but your actions, that you're treating Jesus like he's a king? And not just any king, king of kings. Lord of Lords. You're treating him like he's your Lord. Right. Now I wanted to touch on this. Let's look at the lost world. Jesus, remember, he's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's coming back and he's going to judge the whole world. Everyone gets judged. The lost world is judged. Revelation chapter 20 verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great. People who think they're great. <laughs> and people that are small. Okay? We're talking about, today it'd be society. We have people who think they're kings, they're lords, they're all powerful. You have people who think they're gods, lowercase g gods. Okay, you got the great all the way down to the small. Stand before God, and the books were open, and the author, and another book was open, which is the book of life. Notice it says, and the books were open. The Bible, that people think the Bible is just one book. It's a collection of books. Bible is a library. It's just a library of books. Okay? The books are open. And another book was open which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the book according to their works. There we see the works being judged. Our works are being judged. Their works being judged. What's the difference? We already talked about it. We have Jesus' righteousness imputed to us. These people don't. How do we know that? Verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and, the, and death and hell were delivered up and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whoso was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. They don't have Jesus' uh, righteousness imputed to them. Okay. If you come across this video and you make it this far, I know we're getting towards the end, uh, 
If you're lost, that's your destination. You're on your way to hell, and you deserve to go to hell for sinning against God. One sin makes you worthy of hell. Okay? You don't have to use his righteousness and purity. A lot of false Christians out there okay, that will, false professing Christians, they don't have a fear of God. They ignore the true gospel. They don't have a ch good works that follow the changed life, new creature in Christ Jesus. And they're go you're going to wind up standing before God at the great white throne to be judged. Why? Because Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And you didn't treat him as such. Right. Second Timothy 4 1, another verse that talks about how he's going to judge everybody. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead. When we read in Revelation, notice how it kept saying, and I saw the dead, small and great. Okay. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book according to their works. Okay? And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. What's going on here that we read in 2 Timothy? Well, the quick is saved sinners. The dead are lost sinners. Okay? At his appearing and his kingdom. We're, there we see the chronological order again. The judgment seat of Christ, we're going to see the appearing. Jesus appears in the clouds and calls us to come home. And we go up there and we all go before the judgment seat of Christ. And his kingdom. The end of the thousand year reign. Okay. Uh, Satan's going to be let loose for a little while. There's that part. But at the end of all that, that's what the judgment seat, or the great white throne judgment is going to happen. 1 Corinthians 11.31 It's going back to judging ourselves. I just wanted to throw this back in there. We who are truly saved, we need to judge ourselves. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged... We are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. That's the second part. We have this right here as our foundation to tell us the do's and the don'ts. What our faith is supposed to be. What we're supposed to be standing for. What we're supposed to be standing against. Okay? And when we lose sight of this, God even chastens us to get us back on track so we can get back to doing good works. Get back to living the life of Christ. Okay, he doesn't just leave you hanging. Oh, he fell off. Okay, he can stay off for the rest of his life as a Christian. No. Chastening is a good thing. It gets us back on track. Okay? We are to judge ourselves. Why? After doing this study, brothers and sisters of Christ, because you need to understand, just as I needed to understand fully and completely, Jesus is a judge. Why? Because he's a king. A king judges, a lord judges. And he's going to judge me one day. I best be judging myself according to God's righteousness. Righteous judgment, I need to start judging myself so I can get myself on track before God starts judging me at the judgment seat. And that fear needs to be there. You have people saying, Brother and Sister Christ, you say that Jesus is my King of Kings, Lord of Lords, He's my King, He's my Lord. Is that true with your actions? When you stray, I'm praying for you, brothers and sisters of Christ, especially in these last days. I've had brothers in Christ talk to me about how things are getting them down and uh, the temptation's getting stronger in the last days. The, the joy they once had in this book, it seems like something out there is just trying to tear it away from them and everything. And it's getting tough in these last days. And I'm praying for you, brothers and sisters in Christ. I am praying for you that your love stays strong, that your stand stays strong, and you keep doing the work of the Lord and continue to live your life for Jesus Christ and treating him like he's your king and he's your Lord by the life you live. I pray that every day. I pray starting here saying, Lord, help me. I've fallen. I've, I've fallen into temptation. I've fallen into sin before. God has had to pick me back up, chastening, get me back, pick, uh, get me to not deny myself, pick up my cross daily and follow him. Okay. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 3. We're going to leave off with this one. Okay. The understanding that 
If you truly believe that Jesus is your King, and He's your Lord, capital L Lord, capital K King, in the King James Bible, that's showing that He's King. Capital K King shows that His authority supersedes a lowercase king. He's above a, the lowercase king. Same thing with capital L Lord over lowercase Lord. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's above Him. His authority is final. Isaiah 11, chapter 11, verse 3. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. You know, just gossip what people, other people say. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove the equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Armageddon, he opens his mouth, double-edged sword comes and wipes them all out. Okay? But righteousness he doth judge. It's a fearful thing, the judgment seat of Christ. I'm not really looking forward to it hardcore. I want to go home. I'm tired of this life. I know there's a lot of brothers. I'm not life, but I'm tired of the lost world, the wicked world. I'm tired of this flesh and disappointing God and the temptations. I'm tired of all that stuff. Right? I want to go home, but I'm still fearful of the judgment seat of Christ. So I ask you a few questions real quick as we end this. Is Jesus your Lord and King? Well, yeah, Jesus is my Lord and King. If yes, do you treat Jesus as your judge? Do you treat him like a Lord and King? With the understanding that a Lord and King judges. Remember, this is just the first part of the study is the, is the righteous judgment. We'll talk about the ruling and his word and everything when it comes to the king and Lord of Lords if you truly treat him that way. So the first part in treating him like a, he's your king and he's your, your Lord is judgment, if I can get it out. Okay. Do you fear that judgment that's coming? You say, yes, I do fear that judgment. Well, good, because then the next question I have to ask you, that fear is, is worthless unless, let me ask you this question, what are you doing about it today? You fear that judgment that's coming in the future, what are you doing about it today? Reevaluate your life, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, that's what communion's all about. It's not about just drinking a glass of wine and, and eating some bread. It's about reevaluating your life. Walk through your house again if you have to, brothers and sisters in Christ. Make sure you're living for the Lord and you're doing what's right. Lord, is there something I need to give up that's sinful in my life? I know there's brothers in Christ that are struggling with things still. I'm struggling with temptation and addictions. Uh, but, brothers and sisters in Christ, go through your life often and say, Lord, am I doing something I'm not supposed to be doing? Lord, am I truly standing for you? Am I doing the things I'm supposed to be doing? Or the things I'm doing... I've been spending a lot of time in the garden. The things that I'm supposed to be doing, uh, some of the things I do that you bless me, that God blessed me with, am I doing it in your name? Is it something I'm supposed to do that I can give you glory in, thanks in, and I can do it in the name of Jesus Christ? Keep going through your life. Sanctification happens all the time. It's a daily thing. Okay? So, the study. If Jesus is truly your king... And your Lord, and you believe He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords, you need to understand that He's going to judge. That's what a king does. That's what a Lord does. Right? They're going to judge you one day. Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and my love for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.